fruit thinning is also a major thing that we do. Um, we do much more of this at the high end of the industry because of people believe in some sort of yield dogmas a lot of times. Um, but we do it really at all, all areas of the industry. Uh, so we're removing un, unwanted clusters. Um, and so we're trying to achieve some sort of desired crop load, which, I, like I said, might be just some sort of dogma. Uh, like in Oregon, many winemakers believe, with really essentially no proof, uh, they, even though they might say they have proof. That's unlikely. Uh, but the, many people would say that the best Pinot Noir is grown at tonnages between kind of two to three tons per acre. Um, but yeah, and also trying to achieve a certain qu crop quality. Um, so we're trying to make sure that we have the correct kind of fruit weight to leaf area ratio. Uh, which is roughly about one kilogram of fruit per every kilogram or for every uh, square meter of leaf area, so that we're able to um, appropriately ripen, appropriate, appropriately ripen our fruit, right? Get it right by the end of the season. Um, one thing that we try to do is we'll, we'll remove things uh, that are lagging behind the rest of the crop. So on most Vitis vinifera, you're going to have about two clusters per shoot. And they're going to be pretty close in terms of their ripeness. The bottom cluster is going to be a little bit riper than the top, generally, but they're going to be really close. But if you have a third cluster up there or a fourth, those are going to be quite a bit different than these bottom two larger clusters. So oftentimes we'll go through and we'll remove those upper ones out of there because we don't want to get that into the winery. And then they might impart uh, some high acids and some kind of harsh phenolics, potentially. Um, we might remove wings as well. This is something that's done on the high end. I'll show you what a wing is on the next slide. Um, yeah. Removing disease or damaged fruit as well is something we'll do, or removing clumping. So fruit will get together on the trellis and they'll clump together and nest. And where they nest, they get disease. Uh, so oftentimes we'll try to separate them by hand or clip them out. And again, that's more at the high end of the, of the industry. And then removing stuff from short shoots, because anything that's on a shoot that really uh, doesn't exceed like 10 to 14 leaves, uh, doesn't really get up to the top wire of a VSP trellis, it's probably not going to get ripe. So we'll have the crew go through and, and chop those off. And again, at the, more, the higher end of the, of the industry, the ultra premium luxury end of the sector. These are wings, by the way. So this is actually something the reason I show you this is just to show you how detail-oriented some farming practices are uh, at the ultra-premium luxury end of the, the wine industry. We will go through with crews and we will actually snip these off. So this main cluster here, and then you have what are called wings, and these are quite a bit uh, behind in terms of ripeness than this main cluster. Okay, so just appreciate the wines that you're drinking. If you're drinking at the higher end of the industry, remember that we're doing kind of absurd things like this. Does this have a measurable impact on wine quality? Probably not. <laughs> it's probably not if we actually tested it. Uh, but I can tell you I've done this many times with crews uh, because it may. So, you know, when you're selling $100 bottles, if it may have a, a uh, if it may have a negative impact on wine, then you do the operation. Uh, yeah, so just to, to let you know kind of when we're doing kind of crop load adjustments, if we do crop load adjustments like in Oregon, if we're trying to hit some winemaker's yield dogma of whatever that is, 2.5 tons per acre, oftentimes we do this around what's called lag phase. So berry growth is a double sigmoidal curve. So you get berry, you get fruit set, you get rapid growth of the fruit, and then it achieves, so this is called stage one here, uh, where the fruit is just... It's growing, and then it stops growing at lag phase or stage two, right? Uh, and that's where we take cluster weights, and then we just double it. So we take the cluster weight at lag phase, and then we double it, and that gives us what is probably going to be around our um, uh, harvest yield, our harvest weight, right? So then we can make a uh, yield estimate, which is never super great. Uh, but then we can go out and adjust our crop down to hit some sort of winemaker's dogmatic uh, uh, yield. People do believe that lower yield equals higher quality 
because they think they're getting more flavor, more aroma, smoother phenolics, maybe more color, more even ripening uh, sometimes. But the reality is that really this is just a simple oversimplification. Uh, but this is something you're going to hear consistently time and time again in the wine industry. When you go into tasting rooms, they're going to talk about the low yields and all this and how it makes the wine better. Uh, it's very much an over oversimplification, and we're going to get into that in uh, another lecture. So then, of course, harvest. This is when we're just removing, we're removing and delivering the ripe fruit to the winery. What are our goals here? Get it to the winery quick so it doesn't oxidize on the way. It doesn't start to kick off fermentation. We don't want it to warm up on the way, and then spontaneous fermentation starts, and then we don't really have control of the microbial environment, generally, unless we're doing... Uh, indigenous yeast ferments and with vineyard yeast and that sort of thing, then maybe it's not so much of an issue. Um, harvesting only the desirable fruit, uh, which can is often easier said than done, depending on how well trained your crews are. Um, and if you're machine harvesting or you're hand harvesting, if you're machine harvesting, you're just picking up everything that's in the vineyard. So you're not going to always get all, just the desirable fruit. You're going to get all the fruit. Keeping what we call mog out, so mog is material other than grapes. Um, so mog can include things like snakes. Uh, so like in Australia, uh, sometimes the snakes will go up into the vines and then they'll shake off into the harvester. And yep, that makes it into the cellar. And people do like whole snake ferments because uh, you're not sorting it, right? You're just going and you're dumping all that fruit into a, uh, into a hopper, going into a tank and fermenting it. So yeah, some snakes and things get in there. Um, and yeah, and just maintaining fruit quality from being at a winery. So like I said. So with harvesting, there's a couple ways we can do it, right? Hand harvesting, uh, which many, again, winemakers at the premium, ultramium luxury end of the wine sector would say this provides higher quality fruit, making better wine. Uh, it's easier to sort this fruit out uh, by hand. You really essentially can't sort machine harvested fruit by hand. You can, but it's a waste of time because uh, that would be sorting berry by berry. Um, so this one you can really get pretty exacting about what clusters are actually going into ferments and whatnot. Uh, it's, like I said, much more expensive to do this. Uh, so like in Oregon, it'll cost you know, well over $1,000 an acre to hand harvest, as where for the machine it's about 360 bucks an acre. Um, and the cost can be pretty variable, uh, and the labor supply can be pretty var variable as well. Right, so machine harvesting kind of cuts down on, on that sort of issue, um, and also the reality is uh, the machines have gotten so good that, like I said, that winemakers believe that there's a lot of beliefs that winemakers have that are maybe unfounded, uh, but they'll believe that high, that the hand harvesting gets you better wine. The reality is the machines have gotten so good at this point that they can harvest fruit that will result in a wine that's just as good as the hand-harvested stuff. And we know this through research, like through peer-reviewed research, but also I've done it uh, for several years in a row, trials like this, and the wine didn't, the quality didn't change uh, between the two harvesting methods. Um, so yeah, it's much cheaper than hand-harvesting. Uh, it's difficult to sort. You can use what's called an optical sorter. So the, the we'll look at a machine, it shakes the fruit, the fruit comes off the rachis, it's single berries, and then it go, it, you can put it through in one layer across uh, these like cameras, and the cameras will sense things like color and uh, this, the shape of things. And so, if it's not like if you're doing like Pinot Noir, and the berry is not like black and round, if what's coming through the sensors that are black and round, then it'll fire that thing, whatever it is, out of the stream. Uh, so that's how you sort uh, machine harvested fruit. You can get some more uh, mog in here, like I said, like the snakes and, and rats and stuff, whatever, right? Uh, then in the hand harvested stuff. But again, if you're going through an optical sorter, that, that'll take care of it. Um, and then, yeah, and possibly you can get more phenolic extraction and, and maybe lower quality because of that. Maybe. Uh, the reason for that phenolic extraction is because you're doing more like you're shaking the fruit off and that's going into little tanks and it's kind of juicing a little bit. And so you can get some phenolic extraction in that sort of cold soak on the way to the winery. <clears throat> so now I want to show you uh, what 
harvest, uh, what harvest actually looks like. So you can see this is a night harvest. This is a night harvest in California. You can see the lights be there. The reason they're harvesting at night uh, is to prevent oxidation or lessen the chance of oxidation because it can get really hot pretty quickly in an area like California. And cooler climates like Oregon, New Zealand, generally people don't do that night harvest. You can see them sorting the fruit as they're going into the bend with a hand harvest. And there they're sorting the fruit as it's going into the winery as well. So it's, there's two sortings. There's a rough sort that happens in the vineyard and a sort that happens in the winery. Okay, cool. So now you've gotten a taste for what Harvest looks like. It's just a big dance party. Uh, Harvest is very fun. What you just saw at the end there is a tank dig out. Uh, so when you do red wines, you, you ferment it on the skins, of course, and then you've got a bunch of wine that's tied up in those skins. And so you drain the tank out and then you dig out the tank and then you dump that, all those skins and stuff into a press and you press it off. Um, but yeah, harvest is uh, pretty exhausting. It's, we generally work kind of 12 to 14 hour days, uh, six to seven days a week for a couple of months. Uh, but it's also very fun. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in doing a harvest, let me know. Uh, we, I can kind of walk you through how to go about getting harvest jobs. And you can do harvest jobs like here in the US. Uh, a lot of people in the wine industry, we often travel uh, early on in our careers. So we'll do a harvest here, we'll do a harvest in New Zealand, we'll come back, do a harvest here, then we'll do a harvest in Australia, then we might do one in France before we even get a full-time job in the wine industry in the United States. Uh, that's, that's generally people's career progression, honestly. Uh, it's fun, it's fun, but it's pretty non-traditional and the money's poor. Uh, but if you're interested in doing, um, if you're interested in doing a harvest and you want to travel around a bit, um, let me know and I can kind of point you in the right direction to how to get that done. All right, so machine harvesting. I'll show you the, uh, one of the newer machines. Okay, so this is a machine harvester from a, comp a French company called Polanc. This is called a selective process. So it's going through and it's shaking the vines down at the trunk with these what are called beater bars. On the side, there, there's tanks. There's two tanks, one on either side of the unit where the, and the fruit is dropping into that tank. What you're seeing there is the fruit coming off the top over these rollers and it's doing like a size and shape separation. So anything that's not really round and the size of a berry is going off the side of the harvester. So all that mog, like the reikis and stuff you see there, it's just being rolling off the side of the harvester. Where the fruit is coming from up top, by the way, is like a distimmer. So these harvesters now have basically distimmers on board that can take off all the mog. So You'll see when the when this harvester dumps its fruit, you'll see how very little like there is of like leaves and petioles and reikis and stuff, and it's just gonna be pretty much clean fruit. So the old harvesters used to pull off a lot of leaves, petioles, and reikis and things, and all of those green, all that green material can have methoxypyrazines. So all those green pepper aromas and stuff, that sort of thing, and harsh phenolics. So with old harvesters, yes, they provided fruit that made wine of lower quality. But now that we have this kind of selective, these onboard processing units uh, and ways to sort out the, the material other than grapes, we're getting much cleaner picks that really don't have any kind of uh, 
noticeable quality difference in the resulting wine. So now you see it dumping and you can see how clean that fruit is. Let's try to look at it, try to find any green material in this. Okay, cool, right? Yeah, they're pretty neat machines. Uh, and certainly, as, and I'm gonna show you financials at the end of this thing, uh, at the end of this lecture, but, uh, we don't make a lot of money in this industry. We really don't, in vineyards, we make very little. Our internal rate of return for a contract vineyard is one to 5%. So you're better off really essentially putting your money into, a, uh, into an index fund uh, than you are into a vineyard. Uh, and so as labor in the US has, and really all over the world, has gotten more scarce uh, and more expensive, there's been higher demand for better machines. And that's what's really driven innovation in these machines is that we need we now need these machines uh, at the higher end of the industry that we didn't really before uh, and so but we can't afford to have a quality degradation and the premium ultra premium luxury into the industry uh, that's kind of what's driving that sort of thing <laughs>